In the month of blossoms and fragrance, the summer heat is building up at the capital's north block, the office of India's finance minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh. And as India's man of the moment prepares to unveil the nation's annual budget next week for the fifth consecutive time, the motive force of the country's reforms program finds himself tugged by the onward push of economic liberalization and the backward pull of political populism in this crucial year preceding the general elections. Apex industrial organizations and business leaders feel that the finance minister faces his toughest test in giving a human face to his policies, an orientation that should neither hurt the pace of liberalization nor the interests of the people at large. As far as I understand this government, they are not going to go for any populism of a nature which will hurt the economy. They will try to bring out a budget which will help the people and the economy. By people, I mean the people at the lower strata uh, who have been conveyed this message that uh, these economic reforms have not given them any benefit. Now, they would reorient in a manner that they understand these economic reforms are helping them also and at the same time take the economy ahead. I hope that uh, this government will not bow to populist measures because what has been set in motion will only fructify in a time frame of five years. So any breaks which are put onto it right now uh, will be unfortunate. As of now, however, providing balance to Dr. Singh's precarious trapeze act will be India's moot economic indicators, which offer enough reasons for both cheer and caution. The happy part is that the economy's growth rate is expected to touch 5.2%, having risen firmly to 3.8% in 1993-94 from 1.1% in 1991-92. Fueling the growth is increase in industrial output, which is projected at between 6 and 8% in 1994-95. This apart, the capital goods industry, which showed a negative growth of 1.6% last year, is expected to grow more than 8% in the current year. Than 8% in the current on the trade front, growth in exports, although beginning unimpressively from April to July 1994, bounced back by the end of the year to clock a rate of 16.9% in dollar terms in comparison with 19.9% in the corresponding period in the previous year. Although rising imports alongside have contributed to a substantial increase in the trade deficit to $2,012 million in the period April to December 1994, up from $731 million in the same period last year, foreign exchange reserves ballooned to nearly $24 billion in January 1995 compared to about $14.5 billion in January 1994. And the rupee, convertible on the current account, seems stable, barring occasional hiccups. But tempering the growth and optimism is the country's inflation, which has crossed over to double digits at 11.4%. In its annual report, the Reserve Bank of India has sounded the alarm on rising prices of articles of mass consumption. But economists, on the other hand, do not foresee a happy combination of low inflation and high growth in the near future. Inflation will probably come down from the current average of around 10.5% for the whole year uh, to maybe 9% in the new financial year that's coming on an average for the whole year. Uh, a 9% average inflation is going to mean a range uh, going down maybe uh, on some weeks to around 7%, going up in some weeks to maybe 11 or 12%. Uh, I think that's what we'll see next year. Uh, but I think in the longer term, it is possible to have growth with low inflation. But experts also add that if inflation has to be reined in, the axe will first have to fall on government expenditure and agricultural subsidies, irrespective of revenue increases in the form of higher taxation yields. Otherwise, the spectre of a rising fiscal deficit, which has grown from 5.6% of the GDP in 1992-93 to 7.3% in 1993-94, would continue to gnaw at the economy. As budgetary measures to increase revenue collections and promote industrial growth, corporate leaders expect 
rationalization of taxation and customs and excise duties on intermediates and finished products in the thrust areas of telecom, electronics, automobiles and infrastructure. The growth in these areas combined with a cut in taxes on capital gains and corporate dividends will directly help to lift the country's stock markets out of their depressed mood. The budget must be able to induce a strong revival of the capital market. It is because of depressed conditions in the capital market that the disinvestment programs of PSUs like ONGC, uh, ONGC and IDBI and VSNL had to be postponed indefinitely. Uh, I think that uh, there is a strong possibility of the long term capital gains tax being brought down to 10 percent for domestic investors as well and the tax uh, dividend income being made exempt from tax. But more crucially, experts feel that the budget's imperative would be to promote private sector investment in the areas of social development, education and infrastructure. It is essential now that things have been left to private sector in a big way in various areas that the private sector involves in social infrastructure like education, health and areas like this. And again, I think budget could be an instrument to provide certain incentives to reorient the thinking of the business to involve them in this area. Whether or not the expectations are met, experts are placing their bets on the budget offering substantial income tax reliefs to individuals, throwing the insurance sector open to multinationals and making imports of consumer goods easier and cheaper. With India's economic fundamentals brimming with vigor, Dr. Singh's expected package of pro-poor programs and development initiatives might still be able to march along with a forward clip of the reform process.